in what is really a historic moment. Um, this time, I am we're going to forego the Pledge of Allegiance because we already did it. Um, but uh, we will, I will call uh, this meeting of the SACOG, Southern Metro Air Quality Management District, and SAC RQ boards to order. And at this time, I will pass the gavel over to my friend, President Sibbon, and she will call the school board to order. Sure. Thank you, Supervisor. I'm glad I don't have to use my shoe. I'm gathering in. Where's my board of directors in turn? <laughs> Thank you. Now, the clerk will please call the rule. The way we're going to do this, because many of us have multiple roles in, in this meeting, uh, is when the clerk calls your name, uh, say here, and uh, which agency that or board you're representing at that time, so that we don't have to do this multiple times. So, please call the rule. All right, first I'd like to note for the uh, record that Jerry Kozlowski, then uh, Don W. have joined since the SACOG meeting. Uh, so the SACOG board of directors is already present. Uh, moving on to the Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management District, uh, Director Daniels. Resident. Absent. Ross. Here. Yeah. Here. You. Here. Lily. Absent. Maple. Here. Yeah. Papa now. Here. Serna. Here. Putting Allen. Absent. Terry. Here. Then. Here. 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 And now for the select directors. Lee Thompson. Present. Fishman. Here. Kurt. Here. Rose. Here. Tamayo. Here. Vice President Herbert. Here. Vice President Sandborn. Here. 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 Now for the select two directors. Directors Budge. Absent. Daniels. Here. Kuman. Here. Kozlowski. Here. 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 Absent, Maple. Here. Concern has which here. St. Allen. Absent. Balance order. Here. Vice Jennings. Absent. Check out of here. Here. Good All right. Thank you very much. At this time, uh, I just want to welcome everyone once again uh, to this joint agency board meeting. And I, I want to say a few things before we get started. We've got a lot of great information that's been planned by the agencies uh, that I think will be very fruitful. Um, but uh, from a personal perspective, as somebody who has the honor of chairing three of these boards, um, I think that this is uh, something that uh, we can all be very proud of. Uh, we talk a lot about regionalism, and we look around the room and, and we're walking the, the walk and talking the talk. Um, I, I truly believe that, that climate change is the, one of the great uh, issues facing uh, our, it's truly existential. And, you know, as a long-time, lifelong resident of this region, I've watched our air quality uh, get worse and worse. Uh, someone who's been involved with air quality issues since the early 90s at, at SMUD. And, um, you know, the, the reason that this is so important, some of you may be sitting there and saying, I live in Placer County, why do I care about SMUD and SAC RT and Sacramento Quality District and all that? Well, first of all, some of those organizations, particularly AQMD, is already working in multi uh, county is not just six, but seven, actually. Uh, and we all know that this is important because greenhouse gas emissions don't know political boundaries. Uh, they don't stop at the Sacramento County border. And beyond that, um, we, you know, we, we, we depend on everything. We're all codependent if we're going to get our greenhouse gas numbers down, if we're going to apply for transportation funding uh, successfully, if we're going to look at land use planning. Uh, we all have to work together in order to do it. The feds and the state have told us that they're going to look much more favorably upon any application for grants if they are from a regional basis, if they have collaboration. And so this year uh, is the first step in it's not the first step, but among the electives, the staff has already been doing this good work, but it's really a, a, a giant step toward uh, that collaboration, which will help us qualify for literally billions of dollars of funds. Um, so, you know, that's why yeah, we, I also want to say as far as the codependency we have on each other, uh, I 
and use SMUD as an example. SMUD has one of the most aggressive uh, climate action plans that you're going to find, and, and my hat is off to them for doing that. Uh, and but if, if SMUD isn't successful, then it's going to be very difficult for the county of Sacramento, for Yolo County, for Yolo, for Sutter, for Placer, for El Dorado, and all the cities we're in, uh, to be successful. Uh, we're all going to have to do this together. I will further say that I don't see this as the, you know, a, a one-off. Uh, I can see this as growing and becoming even more regional and having more collaboration. Uh, so if you're sitting there right now and you're wondering, you know, why did I drive from Colfax or, uh, you know, from even Placerville uh, to be here today to talk about a bunch of Sacramento County agencies, and that's why. Because what happens in one jurisdiction has direct impact on the others. And it's incumbent upon us to work together and collaborate the way we see what we're doing today. Um, so that's, that's kind of the framework that I really wanted to set up here. And uh, with that, I'd like to uh, pass it over to my co-chair for the day, uh, Michael Sibler. Thank you so much, Chair. I am thrilled that we're all here today for the first joint meeting of all four agencies. I can't emphasize enough the importance of what we're doing here today. I think the um, chair outlined it pretty well. We all know the climate change is here. We're all feeling it. And our region has to work together in order to solve these problems, as has been already said. So for today's meeting, I encourage everybody to lean in, to be honest. And sometimes that's a little uncomfortable, but that's OK. That's how we're going to make some progress. And that will lead us towards our beneficial future, which is getting grants and a lot of money brought back home to do big projects we want to do together in the region. And Smart realizes that our biggest goal, the 2030 Zero Carbon Plan, depends on this regional support and collaboration. Partnerships are essential if we want to achieve these big goals. And as we're going to discuss today, our four agencies have successfully collaborated before, and we can do so and even more in the future, which is why we're all here today. So I hope that today's meeting is the very first step to an even higher level of collaboration of all our agencies and to achieve these critical goals and to benefit the whole region. And I'd like to introduce uh, Rita Gallardo Good. She is Sac State Senior Associate Vice President of Public Affairs and Advocacy. Uh, to welcome everyone here to Sac State. So, Rita, welcome. I think we can get Rita a big hand. Yeah. It is my pleasure on behalf of President Luke Lowe to welcome you here to Sacramento State. I'm proud to say that uh, as a 34 year public servant myself, starting um, really my career with public service in Southern California, the power of the work that you do affects every member of this, every constituent of this region, with every student here at Sacramento State. I'm proud to say that we uh, have a, uh, a student um, population of 31,000 students. And as you know, our students are campuses of the Spanish Serving Institute for the Asian Pacific Islander Serving Institute. And so we look forward to seeing how Sacramento State can, cont can continue to support gatherings such as this. We're sharing that we know that we have a place here on our campus, and we look forward to bringing partners with you all the way around. But I can ask you, if you all want it, can you please raise your hand? Well, leadership is here. Thank you very much. And so, on behalf of Henry Wood, I'm really pleased to share that our priorities moving forward for the next few years will definitely be around student housing, basic needs for our students, and seeing how we can expand and invite the community here uh, to our campus. And so, obviously, the partnerships in this room really matter to us. I will also say that on behalf of President we are very happy to know that uh, you see us as an initial convener and that this is your home. Our hive, our home. <laughs> Stingers <laughs> are. Thank you guys for the good. Um, I have to say that uh, President Luke Wood has a nice ring to it. And for those of you who raise your hands who don't have the pill pins, Councilmember Gera, I think, has pockets full of them. <laughs> 
I think at this time we're going to invite Rachel Wine, the director and customer of Customer and Good Strategy for SMART, to introduce an example of multi-agency collaboration that's underway between the four agencies represented here today. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Kennedy, and good morning to all of you. Um, it's actually wonderful to see you. You might actually remember that um, a, a group of staff have actually come and presented to all of your boards over the last um, last year and a little bit earlier this year was that deployment strategy. So today I'm actually not going to be talking about it, but actually focusing on the successes that we've actually had so far since we've actually put it in place. But before I start, one of the things I just want to remind everybody of is why we actually put this together in the first place. So as you know, your CEOs have been meeting for quite some time on a monthly basis, and then shortly thereafter, you actually have a group of staff that have been meeting on, on, on a monthly basis. And it's about collaboration, it's about information sharing, but uh, the CEOs recognize that two things. One is not only do we need collaboration, but an integrated approach for our region is going to be really, really critical to be able to be successful in this um, in developing solutions relative to climate change, especially from a transportation standpoint. They also recognized that with all the funding that was coming available, positioning our region by having this integrated approach and integrated strategy was really, really critical. And I think, so uh, an overarching strategy was developed two years ago. We put together the deployment strategy with a little bit more details on the tactics a year ago, and we've been making great progress towards that. And I'm just gonna highlight a few. There's actually a lot of work going on. Um, there were four key areas that were focused in the strategy. The first was zero emission transit fleet conversion and refueling infrastructure. I think many of you were at the grand opening of the partnership that SACRT partnered with Giddy Up EV and SMUD to install public high-speed charging at the Power in Light Rail Station. And that, when fully equipped, will likely be one of the largest charging hubs um, in the state and potentially the region. SACRT and Yolo Bus actually got funding from Electrify America for both 12 buses as well as charging infrastructure to launch a new transit route connecting UC Davis and the Medical Center. In the zero emissions goods movement and medium heavy duty fleet transition, we know that investment is going to be really key here. <laughs> Excuse me, from a grid infrastructure as well as charging infrastructure to support all the work that needs to go on. All four of your agencies work together to leverage a 200,000 CEC grant to forecast commercial fleet uptake in the Sacramento County and West Sacramento for electric, medium, and heavy duty vehicles, as well as the projections for hydrogen, to study the grid upgrades as well as the workforce development needed in order to manage that transition. By doing that blueprint grant, it's positioned our region to apply for implementation grants that are only available to those that receive the blueprint grant. And SACOG has actually taken that um, and fed that into the mega region medium and heavy duty ZEV infrastructure blueprint grant, which is enabling that proactive planning for the full SACOG region. And in terms of projects, we're actually already working on those as well. Uh, SAC Metro Air Quality Management District worked with Sacramento County, SMUD, and Watt EV and uh, received $34 million in funds from the California Transportation Commission for the country's largest heavy duty vehicle charging plaza that's gonna be located near the Sacramento airport and it's gonna enable that I-5 charging corridor, which is key. Uh, charging stations and clean transportation options for under-resourced communities. We all recently celebrated the opening of the first e-mobility hub at Del Paso Heights. Uh, Sacramento Metro Air Quality Management District secured $3 million in funding to build more of those e-mobility hubs. And just recently, DOE awarded $1.1 million to Frontier Energy, working with SMUD, Sacramento Metro Air Quality Management District, and Clean Cities to engage community-based organizations to develop community-driven plans for deploying more e-mobility hubs. And all of these projects, all of your staff, and all the agencies are working together to make sure that we are implementing them in a collaborative and integrated fashion. Finally, the last pillar was community workforce development, and um, actually all of the grants and efforts that we've been doing, we've been really working workforce development into that element. I mentioned that CEC blueprint earlier, and part a big part of that grant was actually identifying the skilled labor needed to support the EVs, the EVSEs, as well as the grid infrastructure needed to meet that expected growth as fleets electrify under the advanced clean fleets regulation. 
We're working workforce development into all of the procurements and the vendor implementations. Um, that recent DOE grant I mentioned is committing to spend 15% of its budget on workforce developments for persons underrepresented in the EV workforce. And there's multiple workforce development training programs that are going on in the region that all four of your agencies are contributing to and applying for grants for to really ensure that our region is training that future workforce with regards to EVs. So, I talked about a lot, but that is literally a very, very, very small percentage of all the things that these teams are doing in terms of winning grants, as well as applying for new ones in order to attract funding from the region and just very excited about today's dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. We, we wanted to share this example as a starting point to our conversation today because it's a it's an example of a successful collaboration to coordinate the missions and resources to figure out the best alignment. It took some effort among the agencies to do this, but it's been worth the effort. Don't forget to see the vehicles outside in the parking lot across the street uh, that, that have been uh, arranged to be here today. Um, there's exciting technology and uh, improvements that are happening every day and, uh, and, and you should avail yourself to them. At this time, because we don't want this to be a meeting of, every, of people just talking to you, is there any members of the board that have any comments or questions uh, uh, for uh, or, or of the issue? Yes, sir. Mr. Fishman. Thank you, Chair uh, Kennedy. I just want to, I was at a conference earlier this week in um, uh, Utah about renewable re uh, resources, renewable energy. And one of the things that struck me home about that uh, was we're, we're competing for some of these dollars and resources, not just regionally in California, um, throughout the Western United States and throughout the country. So the fact that we're all here together, I think is gonna help that. This collaboration means something. Um, and I, I just uh, try to repeat or paraphrase something that a gentleman from the Colorado um, Solar and Storage Association said about workforce development. He said, if you can breathe and fog up a piece of glass on a cold morning, you can get a job in Colorado. Um, so we are, we are also competing for the workforce. And that has to be a part of what we end up doing here in the long run. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Anybody else? Yeah. All right, President Sambor, do you have anything? No, just, or is there somebody else? Yes. Yeah, I just thought I would um, just add that um, my name is Jesse Lauren. I live in Winters. I'm pretty sure I hold the flag for coming from the farthest west of this <laughs> I'm the, at the edge of Yolo County. But um, I just wanted to mention that um, as far as like collaborating, uh, Valentine Energy along with St. Paul have worked together to um, uh, uh, to install public charging stations that aren't proprietary throughout Yolo County. So member jurisdictions um, have these charging stations. Two, two of them are in Winners. I think Davis just finished theirs. Woodland is building theirs. Um, it's just a great thing to see, and it would be nice to have this regionally, not just in Yolo County, so that we could all benefit from being able to travel to each other's cities and have uh, a place to charge our vehicles. Thank you. Thank you. I'm proud. Uh, SMED's a proud uh, supporter of your CCA and yep. staff's your CCA. So thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay. So we have many more opportunities to collaborate in this region to adapt and strengthen the infrastructure in our communities in the face of disasters. While Congress passed once in a generation funding for infrastructure through the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, this is a different approach than the federal government's taken in the past. There are three things different here. First, a lot of these funds are one-time opportunities. It's unlikely that many of these grant opportunities will continue to the, at these funding levels once the funding is gone. Second, the majority of funds are going through out through competitive programs. No state, no region, and certainly no individual jurisdiction has a guarantee to win. And third, many of these grants are strongly encouraging, as I said earlier, if not requiring regional collaboration. With that, I'd like to uh, invite Rafe Porter, the program manager of the Sacramento Metropolitan Air District, to present CPRG overview. Rafe. Thank you, Chair Kennedy, uh, President Sanborn, members of so many boards from around the region. Uh, 
And I do want to thank you for being here this morning. I think this is not only a sign of collaboration, this is actually action steps towards collaboration. And you actually will hopefully adopt a, a resolution uh, a little bit later. Um, as uh, Chair Kennedy mentioned, uh, Rafe Porter with Sacramento Air District, the Air District with other Air Districts um, have the goal of trying to reach local, regional, state, and federal air quality and climate change goals. Um, and part of that, um, and what I'll be talking about today, is the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant, otherwise known as uh, CPRG. Let's see if this advances. Uh, oh, probably jump two now. Um, so CPRG, um, uh, or the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant, is a grant administered by the federal um, EPA. It is a grant that is, is, as the name alludes to, it is a plan to uh, prioritize projects that reduce uh, emissions and the impacts from climate change. So the South Metro Air District received one of these grants, um, and we're working in a seven county region, so larger than the State Park region, so it's um, Sacramento, Yolo, El Dorado, Placer, Sutter, Yuba, and Nevada. I think I got them all right. Um, so it's a, it's a larger region um, that we're working at, and we're working very closely with your staffs um, at the cities and counties and our partner agencies and, and various boards that you sit on. Uh, there are two phases uh, to CPRG. The first phase is the planning phase, and there's two deliverables, two key deliverables in that. The first is a priority climate action plan, which is that collection of collaboration of all of those local as well as statewide goals. So we're, we're working on your climate action plans. We're taking the policies out of your general specific plans. We're working on policies that SMART and other partners have brought forward, and we're collaborating those. We're, we're doing the analysis on the impacts that they have. We're also pulling in some statewide resources um, out of the CAPCO and GHE Mitigation Handbook. If you're not familiar with CAPCO, that is the California Association of Air Personal Control Officers. It's basically the coalition of all the air districts from around the state. And they've done an analysis and, and they've come up with this great uh, tool and resource that a lot of cities and counties use to, to quantify those GHG mitigations. So we're compiling all of these into the Priority Climate Action Plan, which is due um, uh, in March of 2024, so really just right around the corner. The second deliverable in, in the CPRG is a comprehensive climate action plan, and that's basically due two years after that Priority Climate Action Plan. And this is a much broader and deeper look at climate actions throughout our region. So we're gonna be looking at measures outside of the Priority Climate Action Plan, and looking at what other benefits, aside from just reducing greenhouse gas emissions, a lot of those measures will actually have. Um, and so again, we'll be um, coordinating, collaborating with uh, a lot of your jurisdictions. The second phase of CPRG, and really sandwiched between those two uh, deliverables of the first phase, is the implementation phase of that. And, and the work is actually starting on that, and, and really this is kind of the first step, this meeting towards that um, application phase. Um, and there's two components of that application. There is a pre-application uh, that is due just right after the first of the year in 2024, um, with the final application doing, being due in April of 2024. So a lot of work between now and then, but I, I think, you know, again, that collaboration and the steps you're taking today are leading towards that. So what does this look like in Sacramento? Hopefully we'll get to see you here in a second. Um, a lot of the work that we've done um, up till now and I, actually, I'm going to back up a step and say that our region is very unique. Um, it's different than a lot of the other metropolitan areas that receive this grant, a lot of different than a lot of the states that receive this grant. And that's due to the diversity of our region. Uh, we have rich agricultural lands. We have urban, suburban, and rural developments. We've got rolling foothills. We've got high Sierras. No one else in the country is faced with the diversity of climate impacts that we have. And that is not only an, an issue, and we don't see that as an issue, we see that as an opportunity because we really have the opportunity to say, yeah. we've got this breadth of issues that we're faced from the climate perspective, and it's going to take a, a large swath of, or a large group of uh, climate mitigation measures to really address those. And that's really best done, not individually, not grant by grant, but collectively as a whole to, to put this forward as a collection of measures that we think is, is going to, to address those impacts here in our region. And so we've come up with kind of a, a three ca general categories that uh, compile all of the measures that we've put together. So this includes the built environment, transportation, and natural and working lands. 
As you can see, there are subcategories under each of those, and each of those subcategories has the very specific and direct actions that our region will be taking. So we'll continue to work again and collaborate in, in putting together that final application. There's a few things that need to be addressed in that application. Obviously, any projects or measures need to be in this priority climate action plan that we're working on right now. Uh, we need to make sure that it actually does reduce GHG emissions, but they will be looking at some cost effectiveness measures. We'll also be looking at other benefits, so it's not just the reduction of GHG measures and the impacts there, but we'll be looking at other criteria pollutants, as well as just other impacts that it has on quality of life throughout our community. We'll make sure that it's you know, um, uh, affecting those in, in low income and disadvantaged communities equally as it is everyone else throughout the region. Um, we're also going to um, be continuing that regional collaboration. Uh, and EPA has, has underscored, I keep looking up here because I, I, I want to actually get a marker and draw under there, that this is not um, a, a whole bunch of grants that are going to be offered to the regions. They're really looking at just a couple in every region and they really want regional collaboration around that. So it's not three, four or five grants that we're going to be looking at. It's one or two in this region that we're going to have to compete really hard for. Uh, next steps for all this, uh, really, as I mentioned before, we're taking this first step right now with this action right here and the collaboration that, that you're all doing around the table. So again, really appreciate that. Um, we're, we've put out a survey to, to your staff um, to ask them, okay, we've got these priority projects. How do we further prioritize the, the projects within that and make sure that we're moving um, the, the best projects forward? Um, with that, we've also sent out a survey to find what is the best time to meet in early December because we want to sit down face to face and actually start to, to figure out again how to move those projects forward. Um, during that time, we'll be ideating on what are the actual best projects and we'll start to winnow those down for that pre-application which is just due right around the corner. Um, during that time, we'll also be finishing up the actual priority climate action plan and getting that submitted in March. Um, and in that time, we'll find out if we can actually qualify and, and put in for the full application, which is due in April. So a lot of work, um, but the Air District is going to continue to collaborate and lead this effort on the planning and the implementation side, and we'll figure out what are the best projects and who, who are the best partners to move that forward. So I will stop right there, turn it back over to the chair. I will stay up here if there's any questions. Yeah, why don't you stay for a second, Ray. Thank you so much for that presentation. So there's a lot of work to be done in a very short period of time, Absolutely. collaboratively. Um, does anyone have any clarifying questions or? Yes. Can you grab this a comment, I guess. Um, sorry, I'm trying to, okay. Um, I think that the, I'm really glad to see something like building decarbonization and benefits to low income communities on there, but I wanna, I guess encourage the agencies to be really bold with how we think about benefits to low-income communities, specifically around energy burden um, and energy cost burden. So one thing that um, part of the reason I have a call right now is we were doing a tour in the Central Valley of building decarb efforts. And if you're transitioning someone from say using wood to heat their home to having an electric appliance in their home, their energy bill will go up unless you couple that with weatherization and other improvements to the building that will reduce the energy consumption more broadly. And so when we think about benefits to low-income communities, I guess I just want to encourage us to really think about those real cost impacts um, to those households and ensuring that we're being really thoughtful about how we couple things together to ensure that in the end those cost burdens are, are going down, which is very possible um, yeah. over time. Great, great point. Thank you. We'll definitely incorporate that. Excellent point. Yes. Sorry, uh, uh, City Union City and my district in Sutter County, we're actively participating in the state's Green Moon's World uh, program. We have we obviously see what we need and want infill housing in the center of Yuba City and better models of walkable suburban developments. But um, unfortunately, the, due to lack of infrastructure, that um, we cannot provide those. You know, we can't provide that for the community. Are any of these federal dollars available to help development such as housing, where you know people wouldn't have to drive as much, um, lower the local <coughs> carbon pollution, decrease carbon pollution? And could these funds be used for infrastructure projects to build those? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And we've already started to coordinate with SACOG and making sure that Green Means Go is one of the, the um, projects that falls under the, the built environment piece. So we're actively working um, with, uh, with them as well as some of our consultants to quantify those measures so they can come forward through that, that priority climate action plan as well. Great. 
Yes, go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Wendy Thomas, uh, El Dorado County Board of Supervisors. And it's appreciate everyone coming together to have these conversations. Um, I was grateful to see that the natural and working landscape was a key focus area for this very, very unique opportunity to really make progress in our area. And I'd like to take a brief moment to um, highlight some of the Collaborative, collaborative efforts that El Dorado County has embarked on recently to address climate change and resiliency. And um, we all realize that this is not just a SAC County agency issue, that El Dorado County rec rep uh, represents a large uh, land mass, and 53% of our county is the National, El Dorado National Forest. And following the Caldo fire, we realized that the county was not at all. And we realized we had two choices. We could say, thank goodness the Caldo fire was done and just put our head in the sand and wait till the next next disaster, or we could do something radically different. And so we did something radically different. And collaboration is the operative word here. And so we realized that we're, there were a lot of siloed efforts in El Dorado County working on resiliency, but the need is so great that we really needed, the county needed to be at the table. And so we created the Office of Wildfire Prepar Preparedness and Resilience. And it was a broad collaboration of our US Forest Service partners, CAL FIRE, all of our fire districts, our, um, our RCDs, and other working professionals, our fire safe councils. They are now under one umbrella. And whereas we had 53 fire safe councils all bringing forward their plans and competing for the same grants, they are now under one umbrella and their efforts are integrated with each other. I had an opportunity to talk with State Marshal Daniel Berlant, as well as the U.S. Forest Service Chief over wildfire in Washington this, this year. And they said that our efforts here in El Dorado County are now a model in the state and across the nation of what collaboration looks like. So um, I, I would like El Dorado County to be an active partner in this because we all know all of the amazing efforts that all of our jurisdictions are taking as far as making headway and zero emissions and our infill projects. They, all can be undone by one catastrophic wildfire. So um, really look forward to participating and making sure that El Dorado County can be a good neighbor and make sure we have a resilient region. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and we are um, coordinating with uh, with your staff. So they, they've been a part of the process so far. And thank you. And I think we've heard for now from Yolo, Sutter, and El Dorado. So is there someone from Placer? <laughs> Pastor's turn, uh, Bonnie Gore, Placer County Supervisor, and I appreciate Supervisor Thomas's uh, points about the concerns about wildfire, right, and forest management uh, between El Dorado County and Placer County, a huge issue. And so, you know, what, are, goodness, what are some of those things that we can do to address that? Biomass, biomass facilities are very strong on our radar, radar as a community. Placer County Water Agency, Andy Fecco, the general manager, is here, and they've got a project in Placer County um, off of I-80 over area uh, to have a biomass facility. But Placer County has one up in the North Lake Tahoe area, the Cabin Creek Biomass Facility. And the idea is this facility would generate, it's a two megawatt electric power generation, but to produce uh, fuels uh, that would go back into our fleets, et cetera. And as we think about this, right, biomass is great. Uh, it, it costs, and I think the co we're starting to see that the benefit outweighs the cost, right? We have to be able to get the fuels out of our forests. As we, um, as we thin, as we address just forest management, we've got to do something with those materials. And biomass is a great opportunity to do that, especially up in the North Lake Tahoe area along the I-80 corridor. And, you know, in addition to just addressing those fuels, right, we're, we're talking about preventing future forest fires. And we've all experienced the horrible, horrible air quality. We can do all these great things, but if we have more forest fires, it just wipes out all the efforts that we've made in our communities uh, when we have to breathe this horrible air. So there, there's a wonderful benefit, air quality, healthy, and keeping people healthy. Um, I think these biomass projects are so important for us as we move forward as a community. Thank you so much. And I, we couldn't agree more. And in fact, we just did a biomass tour with SMUD and uh, Department of Conservation. 
and uh, we're looking and working with Moat on a pilot project to actually create um, green hydrogen here in the community from the biomass, and we have a lot of it, and this is where my day job, which ended up on the placard, the National Storage Factory Council, I do waste management by day and electricity by night, um, so this is where my worlds come together, and it really could work out very well for us, and then produce green hydrogen here that we could use to fuel fleets. And I think the next person was um, Director Rose. Yeah, I, um, I wanted to ask, um, you mentioned that there was the two parts of the application process, both a priority and a comprehensive. And so I was wondering if you could give some examples of projects that would be considered a priority versus something that would go under um, the comprehensive application. And sort of looking for more details in the sense, doing things like VMT reductions is very challenging, but electrifying, for example, the PepsiCo trucking fleet is something that's much more doable in a very short period of time. Yeah, so the, the, the priority um, plan will be made up of projects that are, um, I, I want to say, a little bit more shovel ready. So there are projects that, that on a, um, a lot of the agencies have already taken action on, have already taken some steps, they're already in existing plans. There's maybe some quantification around a lot of those measures so that they'll be ready for that application, which is due you know, very quickly after the first of the year. But the EPA is also working, as you alluded to, some of those quick actions. So that'll be the, the bulk of the priority climate action plan. The comprehensive plan will be not only those measures, uh, because we'll be looking at a deeper dive on some of the benefits and co-benefits of those. Well, then we'll start to look at what are some of the other um, actions and some of the other measures that, that the region could take beyond some of those more shovel-ready projects, if you will. Um, and I, th I think, and, and, and we're going to really work really hard to, to make the best priority climate action plan, the comprehensive climate action plan as well, because we're pretty sure that there's going to be the next round of funding. What is phase three and phase four? So we want to be ready for that. So we're going to make sure that like, that comprehensive climate action plan is ready for those, those next phases of, of implementation. Great, thank you, Rish, and yes, down here. Thank you very much, Alice Dowden Calvillo, Mayor of the City of Auburn, and I just wanted to step back and echo the comments from my colleague on the Placer County Board of Supervisors about the importance and the um, to really address this issue of wildfire resiliency and, and promoting and supporting biomass facilities. Auburn is located in Placer County. We are a, in a high fire severity zone, so we understand not only the implications of wildfire, but you know, from a from a destructive uh, perspective, but from an air quality as well, because absolutely, if we don't start addressing that now, all that great work that we do here with the EVs and everything else just goes out the window, because that that smoke just comes down here and just is, is incredibly detrimental. So I just wanted to go on the record to echo and to support the comments, and also from Supervisor um, Thomas, also with El Dorado County. I want to get with you and talk to you more about what you're doing. So. Sounds good. Thank you. Oh, good. The meeting's working already. <laughs> uh, and I can tell you, in my waste management job during the day, uh, we've lost a lot of biomass plants in the state in the last decade. And if we don't work hard quickly to support those that remain, we will not have them as an option. Um, so we really do all need to lean in on that. And this is a regional air quality issue, certainly, that we're bringing in the fires, smoke, and we are learning more about how dangerous it is to our health. So any other comments? Quickly? OK. I think Director Tomorrow. Yeah, I appreciate the comments from uh, from our neighbors up in the foothills and up in the mountains, and and I I, I do uh, really support the notion that we need to get those fuels out of the national forest. One thing that, and you may already have been exploring this concept, but the uh, uh, University of California is is actually looking at ways to use to generate higher value uh, products from uh, small diameter. Uh, <laughs> trees from the forest so that the economics of, of taking the fuel out could work better and, and uh, if if you're interested or if you haven't already been in contact with with the University of California about that contact me and I'll, 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 I'll give you some leads on who to talk to about uh, projects that could lead to uh, different types of benefits coming from the, the fuels that are coming out of the forest thank you
Thank you, Director Tamayo. We'll do one more and then we have to move on. Um, Council Member Lisa, to your comment about biomass facilities, because I think absolutely like small scale locally sourced biomass, especially near the Sierras, is, is critical. I mean, it's not like solar and wind really work well when you have a super forested canopy, but I do want to say that a lot of the biomass that's been shut down have been located in disadvantaged communities in the valley where we're tracking in biomass in a really long way. And so there's nuance here in how we do this and make sure that we're benefiting local communities who need it versus creating, you know, a big draw of additional emissions in communities that are already burdened. Um, and I do just want to say that environmental justice groups statewide with my non-city council member have, have come out with a really nuanced position on hydrogen and really what makes sense in those circumstances that I'm happy to circulate to anybody who'd love to just read it. Great. Thank you for always bringing that environmental justice focus. I really appreciate it. With that, I think at this point, i um, very excited about the collaboration, the conversation. It's inspiring and helpful. Um, and at this point, I think I want to thank you, Rafe, again. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on about state funding opportunities that we have in front of us. And we'd like to invite Bernadette Austin, who's the CEO of Civic Law, to come up and share those opportunities with us so we can keep going after the money. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Uh, hello, thank you. It's so good to see so many friends and colleagues here today. I'm um, really excited that we're talking about our biggest existential crisis um, with a lens on um, health and equity and uh, economic development. So thank you for having me. I'm going to take approximately three minutes or less to talk about state funding opportunities. How will I do that? Not by talking very fast. Uh, so what I'm actually going to do is talk about two resources that we have available at CivicWell. One, about how you can identify resources and the other is how we can take action, which I think, given today's meeting, you're all very interested in that topic. Um, so what I'll first highlight is fundingresource.org. This is a funding navigation for California communities tool developed by Civic Law, available online, and very candidly, hard to keep updated because the opportunities are coming fast and furious. Um, I will note that we have a newsletter and we also have social media. Those are really good ways to stay updated. So you personally can track those uh, you, by following Civic Law or the fundingresource.org um, website. Um, and I'll just highlight a, a couple of things that we highlighted in our newsletter uh, that came out on October 26th. Uh, we really put a spotlight on Caltrans STEP grants, so that's Sustainable Transportation Planning, um, and as well as over 20 other grants um, that are going to be due over the next three months in topic areas like planning, climate collaboratives, active transportation, transit, affordable housing, parks, water, and job training. Again, that is one of the reasons that I'm not going to spend three minutes listing every single opportunity for you. Um, however, there's a variety of opportunities for some capacity building and technical assistance, so please reach out to us and other community partners with that. Um, I do also want to mention the California Jobs First Initiative. Some of you may be familiar with this as SURF or the Community Economic Resilience Fund. So Valley Vision and several nonprofits, including us, um, are, working, are working across the eight county region. And this economic development focus has a very strong focus on social equity and environmental sustainability outcomes. So please uh, learn more, check in on that. The second area, so in addition to where do we find these resources, what do we do when we find them? And I want to encourage you uh, that you already have staff who are engaged in a number of initiatives um, and so continue to provide them their su the support and guidance they need. So we at CivicWell um, convene the Capital Region Climate Readiness Collaborative. It is a membership network and it encompasses the six county region. Um, you all are already members, a large number of nonprofits, grassroots groups, um, private sector groups as well, um, are coming together and we've been meeting regularly for several months. The group has been around for several years, but we've been meeting for several months to do some coordination around these funding opportunities so that we're not competing with each other, but also we can bring together the strongest regional proposals around planning and implementation. Uh, so I'll also highlight that in addition to managing that regional work group, Civic Law also convenes ARCA which is the Alliance of Regional Collaboratives for Climate Adaptation. So we can also bring in some really great best practices um, and a statewide perspective of what other regional collaboratives are doing. You can learn more about that at climatereadiness.info. And with that, I'll, I'll, I wanted to keep my remarks short so I could entertain a couple of questions. And I know we've got a really packed agenda. So thank you all. Anybody have questions? 
No, I think we just look forward to hearing about all the ways we can go after the money. Absolutely, and keep supporting your, your staff. They're doing really excellent work uh, collaborating across the region, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks for throwing a wonderful policymakers conference. So we do have a collaborative infrastructure already for us to work together, so it's very um, exciting to hear about that so we can go after these new grants that are coming. And now we're gonna uh, turn to um, a report by all four agency executives on the connections between the funding opportunities and our regional collaboration. I think up first is Zach RT. There's Henry Lee, thank you so much. Good to see you, Director Lee. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning. It's exciting to have so many leaders in one room to discuss the future of our region. Uh, a little bit of background, is the largest transit provider in the region, carrying over 90% of our total region's ridership, with a $1.9 billion uh, capital budget this year. Uh, prior to COVID, Sakati was leading the industry in numerous best practices uh, as the best transit uh, agency by APTA in 2019, uh, and we carried about 22 million riders per year. Now our ridership recovery is over 90% of the uh, pre-COVID level. Uh, the industry-wide is about 75%, so we are ahead of the industry curve. Uh, we are also later focused on our zero emission fleet conversion. This will require about uh, over 700 electric vehicles to replace our existing uh, vehicles. Right now we have only 24 uh, electric buses. We are working closely with air quality district and the first hydrogen facility in Sakati's property. We're going to put a bit out soon. In addition to our zero emission fleet conversion, we are working on a dramatic improvement to our aging light rail system called light rail modernization. And we have already secured over $400 million grant uh, for this project in the last several years. We also focused on a network of golden standard BRT rides. Uh, we work, we work clo closely with SACOG to identify strategic corridors to further BRT network to reach our climate, economic, and mobility goals. The Stockton Boulevard Corridor is our number one priority for BRT. Sakati recently received $5 million from SACOG for this project, and the city of SAC is pledging a 4.5 mile dedicated bus lane for this project too. Uh, we continue to make progress with the streetcar project to better connect two wonderful counties. Uh, the route connects two of the largest infill development sites in the nation. That is really amazing. With tens of thousands of housing units planned or under construction. We know that this region is facing a huge challenge in addressing GHG emissions under both state and federal mandates. And we were definitely working with all partners to apply for as much you know, money as possible or grants possible from federal, state, and other sources. But at its core, public transit gets people to where they need to go while emitting far less GHG. While a car usually carries just one or two people, a bus can carry 50 or more, and a light rail train can carry 300 to 400 individuals. But for transportation to be efficient, it also needs complementary land use development or infill development. Sakati has been working with many partners in last 
five, seven years to develop multiple transit-oriented projects along major corridors. Last year, we built a large housing unit or housing complex for 800 students on the university 65th light rail station, just about less than a mile from here. Uh, as the pandemic demonstrated, public transit is a lifeline service to so many in this great region. 67% of Sakati riders do not own a car. 67% out of 22 million rider, riders with ridership. And one third of the riders make less than $10,000 a year. We have a long way to achieve our equity and social justice goals. But you can count on Sakati's unwavering commitment to try our best working collaboratively with all partners to achieve our climate and equity vision. Thank you for your strong leadership. Excellent. Thank you so much, Director Lee. So I think now we're going to move on to the hydrogen production issue, and I believe that's with the Sacramento Air Quality Management District. You want to give an update on collaboration opportunities at, on that issue? I, I, I'd be Dr. happy Ayala? to. Uh, thank you, uh, President Sanborn. And for those of you that um, I haven't met, I'm Alberto Ayala. I'm the uh, Executive Director and Air Pollution Control Officer for the Sacramento uh, Metro Air District. Um, by way of background, uh, briefly, um, SAC Metro Air District is one of five large air districts in the state, and we are one of 35 individual air districts. And air districts in California share authority with the state and the federal government to implement the Federal Clean Air Act. And at a core, that is really our mandate. Um, but before I talk about hydrogen, um, I want to say this. First, um, I am honored to have the opportunity to address all of you. Because um, to echo what has already been said, what we are trying to do here is simply to be as competitive as possible. And is strategically identifying those areas that are very unique to our region. That's really what this is about. And I think the sprinkle throughout the presentation today, you're going to get an idea of what those unique opportunities are. Um, the second thing is I couldn't help but reflect on the fact that I think it's pretty symbolic that we're here at a university campus. Because what we are talking about today and we, what we are trying to build, the four agencies for our region, is really about controlling our destiny and our future generations who are the ones that are really not only pay the price of climate change, but also get to implement some of the things that, that some of us are gonna leave behind for them. So I, I can't lose sight of that, the fact that there's going to be high expectations on all of us because the decisions we make today will impact generations to come. And the last thing I'll say, which is what Chair Kennedy already stated, but I cannot overemphasize it, is this is a very unique point in time when it comes to environmental protection because clearly we have benefited from the state of California who has funding uh, and who has committed to fund the clean energy transition for many years. But what is different today is we have a federal government that is fully committed to fund that clean energy transition, which is already happening, right? So the question before us is twofold. One, do we want to take advantage of this opportunity? And for that, we need to be really well coordinated, right? And two, why is this opportunity important? Because we can leverage state dollars, local dollars, and the, ma the massive amount of money that is coming from the federal government. If we don't get our act together, our friends at the feds are not going to blink because there's more demand for the funding that there is um, supply. So the money will just go to a different region. And our group of what I call our four amigos, uh, we don't want that to happen. We want to be as competitive as possible. And you have a role because clearly you are the one that is going to be making the final decision. So, with that context, one of the opportunities that is 
emerging in our region, and you, you just heard a sample of some of the activities, is hydrogen. Hydrogen is not a new technology, a new concept. In fact, that's how we power the Apollo missions uh, in the 60s. It was fuel cells and hydrogen. We have been using hydrogen for many years because that's how we get clean gasoline in our, in our cars. So the industrial production is, is well established. What is different today is we can use hydrogen in different end uses, and it does have some really unique value propositions because, and this is very unique to our region, we are a region that is sitting on huge agricultural biomass resources. And this is in addition to the forest biomass that some of you have, have already identified. We are at the cusp of unleashing biomass energy 2.0. So this is not a standard conventional biomass power plants where you take the resources and burn it. We actually have technology that can skip that step. So it's good for clean air. And it just so happens that Hydrogen is one of the best energy carriers around. Why is that important? Because, well, our friends that are smart are going to need to run something else other than natural gas in the remaining power plants that we need to keep the grid running. Our friends at SACRT are going to need hydrogen to run fuel cell electric vehicles. And hopefully, we'll continue down the path of bringing more and more electric vehicles. And also, Biomass is, a, uh, um, hydrogen is a great energy storage medium so that our friends at SMIT, if they need alternatives to battery storage, we can create hydrogen and use it later. So why is that important? Because the CPRG program that we are after has ample flexibility. In fact, pretty much anything that we can justify can become eligible, eligible for funding, and that's why this is important. And we continue to believe that hydrogen is a very unique opportunity where the Sacramento region, the greater Sacramento region, is well positioned given our biomass resources. So the four agencies are working uh, in this regard. And like I said, this is about being the most competitive. We want to be a region that can bring the federal dollars so that we can make some of these uh, opportunities and transition to the clean air possible. Thank you. Well said. I think we can all agree that we're very lucky to have Dr. Ayala here in our regional air district. Thank you so much. Um, and now I think we're going to talk about what we're very familiar with here at SMUD is our grid decarbonization. So I'll turn it over to our CEO, Paul. Thank you so thank you so much, you know, Chair Sam Warren, and thank you so much, you know, Chair Kennedy. I think I think all of us need to take a look around the room. This is really a historic moment. I know when I first became CEO, you know, three years ago, uh, I was having, a, you know, lunch with my good friends, you know, <laughs> Dean Polis, Abertoriella, and Henry Lee. We said, you know what? This region is poised to take this country to a new level when you talk about how do you give an example on a region working together to a clean energy transition? But do it in a way that you don't leave anyone behind. I think something that council member on board, you know, Katie Swan actually talked about today. One of the things that, you know, when we, were, we talk about this clean energy transition, we always talk about the technology, the funding, but seldom do we get to talk about what happens with those people that have no voice. What happened, you know, those people, when you bring those new technologies on, what are the impacts for it? So one of the things that we actually, we were very, very fortunate. I mean, I think that, when the, the four CEOs got together, we said, you know what? Sacramento is poised in a way that it, we have never had before. And there's two purposes. There's two reasons why we think this is. The first, you really have leadership and boards that really believe that climate change is one of the biggest threats facing mankind. And you have our board members taking a five emergency declaration. You have the county, the city, and all the agencies, all the board thinking about this is something that all of us need to deal with, not just for ourselves, but for future generations. And the second piece is that I think as Dr., you know, as, as my good friend Alberto said, this is the first time that you actually have alignment from the federal level to the state level 
to the city level, the local neighborhood level, that people care about the environment and they want to be part of this transition. So when SMART actually, and I think you heard, you know, they talked about a little earlier about, you know, SMART has adopted something called the 2030 Clean Energy Vision. That we're going to completely remove all the carbon from our power supply, but at the same time, also spend about $2 billion in decarbonizing both the building and transportation sector. Because it means cleaner air, it means better health, right? And it means, more importantly, how do you identify as you go through this transition? How do you actually bring jobs and investments into the Sacramento region? So I know just you know, some of the example you've heard already that we are already working very, very closely, you know, with the different agencies. I guess we said to get to this future that we're talking about, to this future that all of us will be proud of, we can't do it alone. We have to partner with everyone. So I think from you know, you heard from staff earlier that we've been working for the last three years. First of all, understanding what is the priority on each of the agencies. And secondly, where do we see alignment that we can leverage each other's resources? So every dollar that we spend, we have multiple impacts. So it's not just about carbon, but it's also about air. It's about getting access to transportation. But it's also making sure that you have inclusive economic development and more importantly, inclusive workforce development. How do you make sure when this region transition to the clean energy future that everyone have a chance to participate? <coughs> so that's really the genesis of how we actually started this collaboration. We say, you know what? There's about three and a half billion dollars. More ever, I think this is a once in a generation that we all sitting there in the room looking at what is going to come down the pike. I'm looking at the new city right now, right? Just people in the city. So we said, you know what? You're going to have to decarbonize the power plants. You're going to have to decarbonize the building transportation. And you're going to have to look at every single home that you have coming through, making sure they understand why this is important. So the first thing that we did is we said, you know what, let's take a look at all the priorities in the agency. Let's line them up together and see where can we actually work together to leverage the dollars that we have from you know, electrifying the buses to putting in you know, neighborhood, what we call neighborhood uh, charging hubs to looking at how do you actually bring hydrogen into the region and start actually laying every single one of those projects, you know, or the carbon capture sequestration that we have right now, hopefully, we're here soon, is a $270 million grant from DOE. And we just won a $50 million grant to upgrade, you know, our infrastructure to produce cleaner energy for the region. So we say, you know what, let's go ahead, let's all the staff work together and identify all the major projects that you have all the possible funding opportunity that you have, and who is the best agency to take the lead to position us in the best position to get those money. So I'm very confident. I mean, our staff has been working for three years now, and thanks you know, to James, we're in, in fact, we're even increasing those collaborations beyond the four agencies. We're bringing the water agencies in. We're actually you know, engaging you know, with, you know, with, with, the, with our state assembly. Now I see I see Darren over there looking at you know how do we engage you know Senator you know Angela Askew's office how do you make sure Omni Bearer's office and you know and Congresswoman Masui's office are all in so they were instrumental in us getting the fifty million dollar grant we just got so what we said we want to do is that given the fact that you have all about three and a half million dollars that's coming down the pike that will be given to Department of Energy which we have a lot of great relationship with. How do we leverage the relationship to bring the projects that SACOG is running, that Alberto's team is running, and Henry's team is running? How do we go to D.C. and support and speak with one voice to making sure that when DOE, EPA, the Small Business Administration give those money, that SMUD as a region is there to speak with one voice? And I think that's why this is so historic today. That when I look around the room, right, you really have four major agencies that have drived a lot of economies in the Sacramento region, but not only driving the economy, but driving the quality of life for the Sacramento region. You heard about, you know, supervisors, you know, talk about wildfires. Absolutely. You talk about biomass. You know, you talk about clean transportation. You talk about hydrogen. All those things kind of fit in the puzzle. So it's, it's behooving all of us to making sure we are 
actively working together on a regular basis to identify new opportunities that's coming up and what is the best way for the region to position to get those funding to bring them into Sacramento. And one of the things when I go to DC, and I'll go to DC a lot and the state legislature a lot, they always ask me, is your region aligned? Do you have the policymakers in your region aligned? Are they supportive of what you're doing? And a lot of times, you know what, in the past, all of us have went in with our respective organizations and applied for grants that we are very, very familiar with. But now we're at a level, we're at a stage now, I think with the four agencies and the four boards coming together to put the region at a much better competitive level. And I'm really looking forward. So hopefully this is just the beginning of us working together. So, so as, as we go on, as we move forward to transform this region, I hope this is a very long lasting partnership that we're starting today. And hopefully we get a chance to grow it also. So thank you very much. I just wanted to add one point to uh, what Paul just said. The reason we worked so hard in the last several years because of two reasons. One, we all know we have historic amount of federal funding from the infrastructure, bipartisan infrastructure law. But this funding is, this funding window opportunity is closing in the next two or three years. Lots of other regions across the nation have already got lots of money. We have to jump into this journey to get as much money as possible. Otherwise, two, three, four years later, we're not going to have this money in the next 10, 20, or 30 years. Secondly, state has a clear mandate by, for example, for bus. In 2030, all bus purchases, our 700 bus purchases, all pur purchases will have to be electric buses. Then by 2040, all buses will have to all convert to electric buses. So the, the, the regulatory mandate and the limited window opportunity for federal money both present huge challenges in front of us. So uh, at staff level, we're working very hard and we you know, certainly we got a huge support and guidance from all you guys as you know, policy decision makers. And we would love to continue and we believe we will continue to get direction and strong support from you guys too. Thank you, Henry. And um, I would say that there's also private money coming. So while we have this immediate opportunity of a lot of government money coming, like with the uh, Giddy Up EV, um, project that was private money. Some of it was, you know, brought to us and we worked together as partners to pull off a really big project in 18 months, which was kind of um, um, remarkable. So that's also out there and the partnerships matter to them as well in the private sector. So I think at this point, we're going to turn it over to James Corliss to talk about uh, what you are working on at SACOG for Green Means Go and collaboration. President Sanborn, uh, Chair Kennedy, um, I'm, I'm the closer here. Um, I, I just wanted to reflect a little bit on uh, the morning, uh, what's been said. Uh, we were delighted to have both the four agencies yeah. get together, but also the entire six counties of the SACOG board. And I've been thinking this morning about definitions of success. One definition of success that we have all the time and I think about every day is how do I get my, um, our communities and our elected officials in the urban core to understand that the health of small towns and rural areas and suburban communities is vital to their health. And just the same way that our small towns and rural communities and suburban communities have to root for the health of the urban core. Because we are absolutely tied together, whether we like it or not, we rise and fall together. Just as I would say part of when the staff got together about this four agency meeting, we were trying to define success and what would success look like coming out of this. And for me, is that each of you understands what the other agencies bring to the table, their priorities. And so when you do things like go back to cap to cap, you're able articulately to talk about a biomass plant in Placer County if you're from another county just as much 
as somebody else from Yuba Sutter can talk about all the great EV charging that's happening in the Oil Management Valley Clean Energy. That, that really is part of what we were hoping to begin to establish this morning. And when we also think about success at, at the SACOG board, we've adopted a strategic plan that has a triple bottom line framework. We start with uh, environment, equity, and economy, right? And we've talked a lot about, and I think we're motivated this morning by environment, reducing emissions, reducing air pollution, reducing carbon pollution, but also equity. And that is honestly something that we have started more recently, honestly, at the SACOG board. But we cannot do any of this work without thinking about disadvantaged communities, without thinking about divides by race, ethnicity, income, urban, rural. Um, and any of these grants that we've just talked about are all going to have, as we know, I think, a major equity and disadvantaged community lens that we have to take really seriously if we're going to be competitive. And finally, on the economy, how do we get the upside of all of this, right? You heard from Rachel from SMUD about the, the really, if we get this right, the important economic upside, the workforce benefits, uh, things like the California Mobility Center that's happening right here with the partnership with Sac State and SMUD, but also things like the Bosch uh, deal landing in Placer County and, and, and many others. So in, again, in that theme of integration, and I, and I hope nobody leaves here also this morning thinking, uh, hey, biomass and wildfire and electric vehicles, oh, that seems kind of different. You know? why, why are we all bringing that together? That is, those things are absolutely integrated, right? And we each bring that across all six, seven counties to the table for things like those climate pollution reduction grants. So in terms of integration, uh, I think you've all heard by now, I know some of our, your boards have gotten these presentations, but we developed uh, across the region a Green Means Go program uh, that you just referenced, President Sanborn, and we got to present this, um, uh, my Deputy Director, Lisa Lazan, got to present to SMUD recently. Green Means Go is actually a way for us to achieve our carbon targets in the state of California, uh, climate and housing goals, but it's translating uh, in some ways those goals to what matters on the ground to local economic development and housing. So one of our best carbon and climate strategies is housing. It's more housing uh, that is in the places where it'd be great if we can get uh, Henry's uh, transit system to be right there and you can jump on the bus, but we'll also take lower vehicle miles traveled. And that's what Supervisor Baines was saying earlier, Green Means Go in Yuba City and Marysville, remarkably very low levels of vehicle miles traveled. Why? Because actually it's kind of a complete community where when you put Yuba City and Marysville together. So we want more housing and economic development in Yuba City and Marysville. That's part of our regional strategy. Uh, we have 26 communities that have adopted green zones. And that work started as the SACOG board knows, and maybe all of you do, really three and four years ago. And it developed to the point that when we had the federal infrastructure bill come along and most recently the reconnecting communities program, and we only had about 30 days to put an application together, all of our jurisdictions are ready. We put in a coordinated application with 10 cities and counties up to the USDOT across all the entire region because we were ready because the work had been done, because we were prepared. And that is, uh, so fingers crossed on that one, 20 plus million dollars. If you know anybody to make a phone call, please do that, let's, uh, let's go advocate. But it, I think it suggests to me the theme of this morning, which is, and Chair Kennedy said this, we have to be a region that's ready. We have to do this work. It is hard. It's much easier work in our silos. It is actually hard to do this, uh, but, it, but we, don't have, we have no choice. Right? And we're up for the challenge. So we want to be a region that's ready. We think Green Means Go is a great example of that, but as is a lot of the other projects that were, that were discussed this morning. So it's an honor to be here, and I'll turn it back to you. I want to thank James and, and Henry and Alberto and Paul. Um, you know, we are so lucky to have the four amigos in this region yeah. uh, and recognizing the importance of regionalism uh, and, and be such champions and forward thinkers. Um, you know, it, it's, it's so easy for people in your positions to be bureaucrats and do things the way it's always been done. I don't see that with any of you leaders. And so I, I really, truly appreciate that. Is there any comments, public comments? Like, yes, Oscar. There, there is. I, I'd like to make a comment if I could. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not sure if I press it to turn it on or yeah. just, just you got to speak closer to it. Speak up. All right. Very good. Well, thank you. First of all, um, <clears throat> I'm super excited about the opportunity that we actually have here 
uh, today, I think, as evident by what you said earlier today, it is historic that we, frankly, can actually all get <clears throat> find a schedule where we can all find a date <laughs> and a time that we can actually be in the room. Um, and I have, and thank you, uh, Rachel, for your comments. Uh, you, I think all of you have crystallized what I think um, is critically important for the region moving forward. But what I will say is that we've had these historic uh, meetings before, not necessarily with this group, but in, um, in our region. And what I have discovered and what I've seen is that unfortunately, right after the meetings, uh, folks go in the parking lot and begin talking about everything that went wrong that wasn't good for their jurisdiction or their boundary or their district or their organization. And you know, the exercise of sort of checking your bags at the door, knowing that you may have to come out with something a little bit less, but something greater for the region is difficult to digest. And so I guess in summary, what I would say in light of what I heard today, which was very well crystallized, and I think anybody can disagree, because if they do, they really ought to speak up now, is I would suggest that we empower the respective leaders to go out in the parking lot today, and rather than talk about what's different and what they don't agree on, or heaven forbid we do that, that we empower them to talk about what we can agree on and what are the questions, the questions, the salient questions that we take advantage of this window that is about to slide away. And we will screw things up for the next generation if we don't take advantage of it and force them to come back to our respective bodies with those questions, with recommendations on how we move forward now, not tomorrow, but now, rather than allowing this opportunity, this historic opportunity, to slip away. So I just want to put that marker out there before we depart, because my fear is if we depart without some, some salient, tangible next steps, it, it could all be for naught. So thank you. Thank you for the, thank you for the opportunity and thank you for Heidi for your initial comments as well. Thank you, Director. Spoken like a true Yolo County regionalist. Sure. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Daniels. Thank you. Yeah, Vice Mayor Brett Daniels from the metropolis of citrusites. Um, a little negative and a little positive. Um, you know, it, it, I, I love the speakers today. I love the uh, the energy and the, and the power and all of that. And But it also demonstrates to me the dysfunction of government. It, we shouldn't have to chase dollars. These are our dollars. They took it from us, and, and then we have to almost like beg for it back. And it's very sad and unfortunate. And it, and it just seems to be missing from the conversation too often that why aren't we pressing our, our federal representatives and our state representatives to, to just give us back our money because we'll know how best to spend it. But instead, we have to spend millions of dollars, tons of hours of staff time to, to beg, literally beg, to give us the money back so that we can do those things and make the air clean and the water clean. And it's just unfortunate, and, and, and I encourage um, each of my other elected officials to to have those conversations with those guys when you do see them at times that uh, you know we need to find a different way because it shouldn't have to be that way. On the positive end, I, I really hope that you've heard Dr. Ayala do it. It's hydrogen. It's not the electrification of everything. That is something that's being forced onto us, and it's and it's creating problems, and it will create more problems in the future. It's hydrogen and the advancement in technology of hydrogen that will get us to where we want to be. And, and clean air is a wonderful thing, clean water is a wonderful thing, but we have to live in the economy and we have to be able to compete and, and people have to have those jobs. And if we keep forcing electrification onto things, that's gonna uh, create a bad problem. And so uh, I think we should tap the brakes if we could maybe a little bit. And, and again, look at hydrogen as the future because it does solve many problems, not just a source of power but also uh, getting rid of a, a source of pollution. So I encourage everybody to keep keep researching hydrogen and uh, keep listening to Dr. <laughs> Thank you, Director. I'm disappointed in you. It took you an hour and a half to mention hydrogen. I, 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 I about that. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Yeah. Allow me to piggyback on oh. hydrogen. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. I will sound like a broken record for some people at the table here, but uh, I, I uh, come at this from, from three standpoints. First, uh, as we've heard, um, SMUD can use hydrogen as a way to store excess wind and solar energy, use it when we need it to produce electricity. Um, there's a lot of our need, needs to go into that, but it is part of our uh, 2030 goal, uh, to, and part of our way to achieve that. Um, as some of you know, I'm an employee of Sacramento Regional Transit, and as we've also heard, this will be part of SACRT's future 
for bus routes that require longer routes, shorter fueling times. Um, we're still looking at, at how many of those we need, but, but that will be part of, of SACRT's future too, I believe. And from a personal use uh, standpoint, I, I drive a Hyundai Nexo that is um, powered by hydrogen. Um, it, it is today's technology. It's there now. You can see my car with all the other electric vehicles out in the parking lot when we're done. Um, I want to make two other quick points. Um, James talked about land use, and we have a lot of people from land use authorities here. Um, I would love to see the land use authorities implement a, a sliding scale of benefits for the things that we want from housing. So if it is um, transit-oriented development, if it is all electric, if there's an affordable housing component to that, um, they can then uh, apply for and get benefits from the county or the city, including things like reduction in fees, priority permitting, priority inspections, a whole host of other things that I don't even know, but, but I'm sure you do. So we are incentivizing the type of development that we want. And then the last thing I wanted to say is, you know, we've talked a little bit about how, well, gee, do we do biomass to help our forests or do we do electrification down here or do we do some other projects? It is not either or. Um, this is, we need to do that and we need to do that and we need to do that and we leave it up to um, our staff experts to come up with a, a priority list and say which projects give us the most bang for the buck and, and that's how we that's how we go. Um, it, it isn't either or, it's everything. Thank you very much. And Director Fishman will be allowing test drives after this meeting. <laughs> Got to fill up yes, with Sacramento. Yes. Um, I, I wanted to piggyback on um, Director Fishman, but also emphasize uh, what uh, our friends from North and uh, Bonnie brought up earlier. Um, how many of you have an electric car? How many of you have ever had range anxiety <laughs> with an electric car, right? So in our six county, region, it is very difficult to get where you need to go with the current charging network. So I appreciate the comments because people are not going to adopt electric cars if they're worried that they're going to run out, right? Um, and so I would like to, you know, implore our group, you know, I was part of the state college plan way back when, 20 years ago, having a regional plan on electric charging network that we can join together. There's a lot of power in joining together as agencies and counties and regions and not having these one-off, you know, city of Rancho or city of Sacramento or county because we don't just stay in our counties or our cities, right? We need to be able to increase mobility um, and, and access, equal access. One of the biggest barriers is a, the cost of electric vehicles and, and not having infrastructure or not being able to have that infrastructure to help. I grew up in an apartment building. And yes, we have programs that have, a, you know, apartment building chargers, but that's not sustainable to put a charger at every um, apartment building, but what is sustainable is putting charging at every public building, at every school, at a park, at um, every state mart, you know. That's what's going to help people, especially in low income bracket, feel comfortable. They can charge for $5.95 a month, which is what the city of Austin in that region does. $5 a month to charge unlimited. You are going to transition, especially with gas at $5 to $6 now, so, uh, gallon. So, I implore all of us, look at that, it's one piece of the very big pie, right? Um, but we are going to have to have a buckshot approach. Can't just be one or the other. To get us to zero carbon by 2030, it will be all of the above and you all tell us what great ideas you might have. But I think this program, I've seen it modeled throughout the country, this is what's gonna help move the needle, especially for those who cannot afford it, right? And if we can communicate to people that you will be safe, you'll be able to get to work, um, at five dollars a month, that is going to help move the needle and, needle and have more electric vehicle adoption. So that would be my one hope for all of us. And there's lots of hopes, right? But this seems to me to be a low hanging fruit item um, that we can all work together and come up with a regional, um, economically um, equal uh, charging plan. Thank you, Director. Thank you. Um, and I want to thank James for your comments about how, you know, if one of us is successful, we're all successful. I think similarly, if one of us fumbles with the ball, then everybody's going to face that because we're all looking at that as a region. And so if we get state or federal monies that don't get implemented fully, then that hurts all of us. And I'm not, I'm saying this because there's a specific project 
in my district in the city that is not anybody's fault. RT did everything they were supposed to do, but the cost went up $20 million because of remediation and all the things. And we're going to have to turn to the SACOG board and the RT board to say, hey, can you help us finish this well? Um, because it's an important project for the region, but also because if we don't deliver on that project, we are very worried about what that means for everybody's projects mm -hmm. down the line for these grant programs. And so I think there's a lot of solidarity to be built. But I also just want to say that um, there isn't consensus around this table. And that's one of the things I love about tables like this. Like, for instance, hydrogen scares the crap out of me. Um, and it scares me because it explodes. Um, you know, there's, when you put hydrogen in the buildings, like movies like Glass Onion are supposed to teach us things. Um, and that, you know, it's like there are certain applications where it's going to make sense and there are certain applications where it won't make sense. And so I think what I'd love to see us do moving forward is create more of these spaces for us to dig in on those tension points. Um, you know, one tension point, for example, the RT board heard about our sales tax revenue. One of the things we're talking about is like, do we reallocate some of this historic revenue that was budgeted 20 years ago to different projects that are going to bring us more PhD emissions that are going to better position us for our other grant funding? Or do we keep funding the same sort of road and expansion projects that we've been funding? That's a tough conversation. And I doubt there's unanimity around this table about how we would tackle that. But I do want to encourage us, similar to what Supervisor was saying from Yolo County, like we need to really be open about where those tension points are so that we can dive into that. Because I do think there's a way, and I appreciate what Greg said in terms of nuance, it's not going to be the same in Sutter County as it's going to be in downtown Sacramento. It's just not. It's different infrastructure, it's different communities. But if we really sit down and dig, dig into the details and have those hard conversations, I mean, that's one of my requests, I guess, is whether it's working groups after this, there's some way that we can keep those conversations going and really talk about ways that we can build broader consensus, you know, about what makes sense for our, each of our communities across the region. So. Thank you. Director Sir. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Chair Kennedy for uh, convening this uh, historic meeting. Uh, I think it's been a long time uh, coming. Uh, I, I think it's too bad, quite frankly, that uh, we haven't had it sooner, um, but I'm glad we're here today. Um, many of the executive directors from the respective agencies uh, touched on the theme of um, necessary collaboration, and I think you know we can all agree that that um, is something that we need to um, certainly nurture and enhance uh, when it comes to something as serious as uh, responding to the uh, closing window of federal resource availability. I do want to point out that we also have in the room, though, another unique uh, part of that collaboration. And as the former um, member of the California Air Resources Board for almost 10 years, I can tell you that, um, uh, quite frankly, I didn't feel as used as I should have been uh, by the uh, uh, various jurisdictions of the five air districts that I represented. Um, but we do still have that opportunity moving forward um, with uh, city council member and now CARB member uh, Eric Netta. So I just was going to wonder if uh, our CARB member had some insights to share uh, with us today. Mr. Yeah, if we're with the, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. First, I also do want to thank our co chairs, you know, and uh, it's if anybody who has to chair a meeting understands how unruly it gets with, with so many people. So I'm surprised at the, at how, how folks have held quite back here. So, but uh, let's give time is up. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, we're tired uh, hey, you serious? I know. I know. Uh, since his days on the school board with that. Yeah. Um, uh, but, but I, I will, I will start off again. I think a theme here, uh, one that was uh, talked about by staff, uh, the uniqueness of our region, the uniqueness of this scenario. Uh, and then again, the, the need to be competitive. And Director Cerna, uh, board, uh, Supervisor Cerna as a, as a former board member and a, and a director on many of these boards is correct. Um, I think it was un an unfortunate for us, a failed opportunity during his tenure on the CARB board that we did not take advantage of, of having a local rep for that region. And the, that, that seat represents um, the Sacramento uh, Air Basin which is not just the county of Sacramento, but uh, it also represents El Dorado, Placer, Yolo, uh, Sutter, Yuba, and, uh, and we're members of the Basin Control Council. So we go all the way up to 
uh, Glen County, uh, all the way up to the Oregon border. Uh, what's the, uh, Alberta, do you remember all the names? Uh, nine APCOs, 11 counties. Nine inner districts representing 11 counties. They're representing the 11 counties. Because when our farmers have to uh, prune their trees in the, in the north area, the only option for them is to burn their, uh, their, their uh, uh, biomass. And we down here in this area are affected by it. Uh, many of us remember at the time when we used to burn rice fields. Uh, when rice was burning and you'd go up to Placerville for ice cream or something, in Placerville it was super smoky because the wind would just take everything up to that area. And I remember when I was in the FFA having those debates about what to do. All I have to say is our region is unique, and yet we haven't been competitive in that sense. And I've noticed it myself, so it's been a good, a good opportunity for us. I think uh, uh, Board Member Cerna here, Supervisor Cerna has, has made it well, that we say the legislature and the governor's office is as, as one aspect, but we have many agencies that are also impacted in this. And so the benefit of this today, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll hit on a couple of points, is for us, I think the resolution speaks to it, if I'm correct, Mr. Uh, Mr. and Mr. Chair here, is that uh, that we have a joint legislative task force. And so I think the a couple of things that we're, we're directing staff if this resolution passes is that we have a joint uh, policy platform on issues that we can go out after and direct every agency from Cal Recycle to CARB to our state here, all of those which have pots of money, not just the feds. The feds is a clear one right now. And I'll bring up Green Means Go because uh, Green Means Go, REAP 2.0, uh, was a success that was led by the Sacramento region and it benefited the entire state. But, uh, you know, it was a small pot that once it got allocated, the rest of the state kind of just moved on. And so it was a success for us. So one piece that I want to highlight and thank the, the work of, of SACOG is the advocacy for REAP 2.0. I think that's an actionable thing that should come out of this today is saying we should be advocating and supporting REAP 2.0 because that brought money to every single county that had a green zone. The, uh, the second piece I want to bring up uh, was the skilled labor aspect of it. Uh, you know, we're here at, at the university, but we really haven't engaged and, and done an analysis of what our deficiency is to actually execute some of these projects as a joint agency. We need to be engaging both UC Davis and up Sac State and Los Rios here in our pressure programs to having as part of our outcome here is once we go after this, how are we going to actually achieve it? Because we do have a lack of workforce, even in our own cities to accomplish our, our piece. And then our third piece here uh, is that I think the resolution, um, we should consider whether it's today or in the future. But I think we need to be very specific about biomass because Biomass, even with our urban centers, such as the regional sanitation facility, it is going to be able to produce, and I want to credit a lot of the board members, board members uh, that are on the regional sand board for, uh, uh, for this effort, uh, because we're going to be able to produce our own hydrogen to fuel uh, our vehicles, our heavy duty vehicles in every aspect. But if we're not explicit, in my opinion, uh, and uh, having traveled now to a number of the counties as a car board member on this, then I think that uh, that we will be we will, we will become um, uh, uh, what do you call it uh, diluted in what our intent is. So I do think that biomass. Uh, when I went to Winters, um, Winters is using biomass in a unique way to look at our walnuts and what we do with our walnuts. And they're not only producing electricity and heat for their their production, but they're creating biochar, which right now UC Davis is looking at. The carbon, the, the the graphite of it, and that the technology of battery in the future looks like graphite may be a, a, a promising outcome. So all of those pieces, I think, that are happening. Uh, Ms. Sanborn, Heidi Sanborn, when we were at re, at the Republic Services, the bio, the the, the, the separation of organics mm -hmm. and being able to separate now our organics and be able to produce uh, natural gas, but converting that to hydrogen, that's today's modern version of the flux capacitor putting our trash <laughs> and now fueling our vehicles. So can we go back in time? Exactly. <laughs> no, we're, we're, we're flying, you know, we're going, we're going to the future. So um, all, um, and, and then finally, the, the, I think the, the important thing of the, the trails project that's happening, you know, uh, the, I think that the, the 
evolution of e-bikes and the connection of our uh, regions through um, trails and bike trails and looking at another mobility, it's that point about every aspect is all connected uh, of it. But um, to going back to that point, we haven't had a collective vision. So if someone was to ask me right now at the CARB level, well, what's the region's collective voice? There isn't one. And so I, I, what's exciting about this is I think that this resolution hits a lot of it. But one, I do think that it's missing is one on the workforce side, uh, and then being very explicit about moving forward with biomass for both our fire prevention needs, our agricultural production issues, uh, and even our urban sanitation needs when we have to look at what SB 1383 is gonna require of us. Um, I wanna thank everyone for being here, and very excited that this is kind of creating a, a mutual convening to do that. Well, thank you uh, to the chairs for managing this today. Thank you. Sam Ratchet all coming to me and saying, you know what to do with the drought? You put a brick in the toilet. <laughs> what are you talking about? I didn't live in the 70s. But apparently in the 1970s, the public message, you know, from us back then to them, to our residents was, save water, put a brick in the back of your toilet. So every flush uses less water. Great. But I still remember that, because that's a simple message about a very complex problem. But this time we did the drought, and I think the message basically was rip out your lawn. From what I can tell, you know, how they'll work, I agree with you along. As a scientist, I was like, well, that's an interesting choice. Yes, you will save water, you know, this year, and you will save on the water bill, but you're going to lose air quality because you've just taken biomass basically out of it. Gas is really efficient at capturing carbon. Um, you're, you're raising temperatures in all those neighborhoods. You're losing all sorts of uh, biodiversity that exists, you know, in those lungs. My point is, it's complicated. It's not just we're about to lung save water. This energy problem is similarly complicated, and we are struggling right now at the National League of Cities with how to address this, because the button that has been pushed is EVs. Everybody has to have EVs. So, you know, in Rancho Nova, we have, I think, the most solar neighborhood in the region in terms of the percentage of energy generated in a, in a neighborhood. And that led to all sorts of complications, mainly for our partners over there at SMUD. You know, we've had strategies where you need neighborhood backup batteries because the cloud goes over the solar and you have a, a massive drop in electrical production. Now you've got to have more transmission lines going into that neighborhood to fill that gap. And that electricity is readily available because we went to, you have to have a refrigerator sized battery in your garage as a backup. And none of these things are bad on their face. They consume a lot of material. You just got to be aware these things are complex. So I've heard voices in this room call for a diversity of approach to this problem. And I really want to urge us to not just talk about the brick in the toilet, let's talk about everything that might be done to address the problem. Because, you know, some big ones on the EV path have not been mentioned yet in this room. Transmission capacity is necessary to get electricity to all the houses that want to charge EVs. So that's, that is a big problem. I mean, the national estimate is we got to quadruple our grid. Think about four times as many electrical lines coming to your jurisdiction. That is an onerous, onerous challenge. Um, there's a myriad of things like that. So to the extent there are voices in this room looking for those complex uh, answers to a complex problem, I would like to support those. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director. Uh, I want to point out, as the chair of Regional SAM, that the brick in the toilet idea is horrible for the pipes that go to Regional SAM. <laughs> Yes, yes. Um, Council Member Early, our alternate on representing uh, West Sacramento. And I would be remiss if not um, mentioning and thanking uh, Zach Barty for, you mentioned it as streetcar. I know that is technically what it is called, but it has turned into light rail extension, uh, which is really important when you think about um, connecting all of our cities. Um, I know Zach RT is working on the designs, updating the construction and everything. and. I'm excited to be here, and as we look towards the future, um, as Councilmember Valenzuela said, we have projects that are that are in the hopper. That the longer we wait, the more expensive they get, and these are things that we need now. And so, I, I hope as we continue to to think and plan for the future, that the things that we are working on now, we are able to truly invest in and and get done, uh, because our communities need it not yesterday, not tomorrow, but right now. Thank you, Director. All right. Uh, I appreciate it. Great conversation. Uh, do we have any public comment? There's no public comment for item one. Okay, thank you very much.
Um, then with that, we will move on to item number two, which is our one action item. Uh, it is the resolution that you'll find in your packet on the last page, the joint resolution of all four agencies. It's fairly straightforward, um, being a page, and um, it, it actually echoes much of what I've heard here today. Uh, so if, if it's okay, if it's not, if any member wants to, we can have a, a, a staff report on it. But um, at this point, instead of necessarily going there, um, I'm going to move adoption of the joint resolution. Second. I'll move. Are you moving it? I, I move. Second. Okay, we have a motion to second. Mr. Hume. Thank you, Chair. Uh, First of all, I implore you not to have a staff uh, presentation on this. <laughs> but, uh, I like this guy. I, I would like to be that guy. I have nothing of substance to add, which I'm sure you'll appreciate, Mr. Kennedy, uh, being my colleague on the board. But uh, I, I would like to point out in the fifth whereas, uh, there is a punctuation after the word drought. And my colleagues don't need to look it up. Only the person that's going to be providing the copy to be executed. Uh, so either the period needs to be removed or the period of the comments should be changed. We'll consider uh, uh, the maker of the motion removing that period. Thank you. The second to approve that? Yes. Thank you. We miss Roberta Glash and we don't anymore. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. I'm going to call the question then. All those in favor? Mr. Chair, uh, before, you, uh, before you call the question, we do need to take public, public comment. Oh, I, I apologize. So, and I will, if I may, I'll note for the public that we do have speaker cards. We're asking able to fill those out if they want to speak. The speaker cards are in this section of the room. We do have some that have already been presented, so we can start going through those if folks has the... Uh, okay, the if we could, and if I could implore the uh, speakers to keep it brief so we don't lose a quorum. Please call out the speaker. Okay, you, so you, for, you, my you don't need to walk them over. You okay. For um, item number two, we have uh, Sophia Markoska uh, on behalf of Defenders of Wildlife. Please approach the podium. Yeah, come up, go ahead and come up to the podium. My name is Sophia Markowska, and these comments are on behalf of Defenders of Wildlife. Defenders is a national nonprofit with over 316,000 supporters in California. We are dedicated to the protection and restoration of imperiled species and their habitats. Defenders strongly supports local agencies working together to curb climate resilience and to meet our carbon reduction goals and clean energy goals, <coughs> such as SMUD's goal to reach zero carbon emissions by 2030. Defenders believes that we must protect biodiversity and ensure healthy ecosystems as part of our climate solution because these systems provide us with clean water, clean air, and food. It is critical that we rapidly deploy clean energy projects and we do so in a manner that does not destroy the intact landscapes and sensitive species. More so, we believe that we can develop clean energy in a manner that is respectful and protective of cultural resources. We support the proposed resolution, including the specific directive to use staff expertise and resources to coordinate efforts in an area of shared responsibility, including land use, transportation, air quality, and climate. In particular, we urge SMUD and the counties within the service area, mainly Sacramento County, to work together to better plan the siting of renewable energy projects and infrastructure. We offer this recommendation because without guidance to developers, we could see more poorly sited projects like the Coyote Creek Agrivoltaic Grant Project which if developed will destroy thousands of acres of undisturbed rare and growing blue oak woodlands, vernal pools, wetlands, and the location of great cultural importance. Therefore, as part of today's focus on collaboration in the spirit of the proposed resolution, we urge SMUD and Sacramento County to work together and include tribes and stakeholders to plan for and locate clean energy projects. It is possible to have clean energy and protect our important natural and cultural resources, but it does require collaboration and planning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. And Mr. Chair, if I may, if I may make a suggestion, um, whoever's turned in a speaker card, we would ask that they'd line, um, begin lining up now so we can keep things Yes, that, that's a great idea. Uh, Thank you, Council. What, what else I'd suggest is um, if anyone wants to turn in a speaker card, if they could do it with, within the next two speakers, that way yeah, we can keep an end point. And we will be keeping a timer for two minutes for each speaker. Yes. Thank you. So for those who have speaker cards in, please line up at the podium and please call the next speaker. Next speaker is going to be uh, Rick Coding for general comments. Thank you. Two minutes. Or less. Speakers three. 
thank you, uh, Supervisor Kennedy and uh, distinguished uh, agency members. I'm Rick Codina. I'm with 350 Sacramento. We're a local climate action group. I'm the uh, chief uh, smud watcher and also on the electrification team. I'm grateful for this meeting, uh, but there's an issue, uh, there's a resource here that's not being discussed, at least in detail, and I'd like to bring that up. Uh, it has to do with land and land availability and solar par power, in particular, finding suitable sites within the county for small to medium sized photovoltaic generation. I mean, all of the counties, really. Uh, SMUD, of course, is the lead agency here, as pg e is in the surrounding area. And SMUD has pledged to, to, to achieve zero carbon. The problem is that SMUD is in a bad patch right now. It's uh, stalled. And as we heard from the last speaker, there is opposition to some of the local and solar uh, proposed plants because of habitat. But many agencies here have control of land. Everyone has land. And uh, if these lands, if they were systematically identified, especially looking for disturbed industrial land within uh, that's either owned by the agencies outright or adjacent, uh, and if this is done by an interagency group, uh, looking for sites that could include solar atop roofs and parking lots, like the, these sunny lots around us here, that, or uh, standalone projects that can tie directly into the grid. After the survey is complete, I think uh, there can be some collaboration with, with, with SMUD for power purchase agreements or even to host the sites directly for SMUD development. And we shouldn't ignore the federal agencies. I wanted to give an example of the Bureau of Land Management very quickly. Uh, there's money available in the IRP for solar over canals. And the Bureau of Land Management has control over the Folsom South Canal, 26 miles. Uh, perfect site for solar. And uh, so I wanted to say that solar may not be as sexy as biomass and hydrogen, but it's available now and it's cost competitive. And I think there's a good opportunity for it to use cost. Competitive. Thank you. Levy followed by Andrew Pecco. You can all come up a little closer so we don't have to see. Barbara, we'll give you a 30 second reminder when your time is up. Uh, good morning, everybody. Barbara Leary, chair of the Sacramento Sierra Club. Um, and uh, I, we uh, support the sentiments that were uh, presented by the Defenders of Wildlife and Rick Kadena regarding um, the siting of solar energy. But what I really want to address here is um, it, it came up in a number of the conversations. And um, I, I think the problem with silos and planning departments being disconnected between SACOG, the counties and the various cities uh, really needs to be tightened up. And this resolution uh, goes a bit of the ways uh, to help accomplish that. But the trickle down effect from the representatives from the various cities and counties um, is, is not really working all that well, in my opinion, as a prior uh, planning commissioner in the city of Folsom and in, in looking at various projects throughout this region. And it's really incumbent that these um, interacting agencies work together better and that ongoing planning meetings um, from the top down within each uh, municipality uh, occurs. Because without that, we're not going to be able to accomplish the goals that are set forth by SACOG or the Sacramento Metro Area uh, Quality uh, Air Quality Board. And um, as it's critical, we need to move away from uh, 20th century planning into 21st century planning. And uh, I hope that this is a first step, but there's a lot of work ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. We have Andrew Fecko on behalf of PCWA, uh, followed by Dan Allison. Uh, <clears throat> good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Madam Chairwoman. Um, appear before you today as a general manager of the Placer County Water Agency and also one of 50 members of the Federal Wildfire Mitigation and Management Commission uh, created by the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. Um, I'm thrilled today to see uh, the focus on watersheds and our forests. Um, we think it's a critical part of, of um, keeping this region the most sustainable place to grow in California. Um, and we think that um, it is gonna take a, a focused effort as we scale up from um, pilot projects uh, led by local agencies on national forest land 
to reduce wildfire risk and emissions, both human health criteria emissions and, and carbon emissions. Um, it is gonna take a stream of funding. We can develop that stream of funding locally. We've done it on other issues, and we think that we can control our destiny even on federal lands. I look forward to working um, with staff of all of our agencies to make that happen. Thank you, appreciate it. Speaker. Uh, next we have da Dan Allison, followed by Mackenzie White. No, Susan. Dan Allison, um, speaking, speaking today just on my own behalf. Um, I wonder where Sacramento Transportation Authority is. Were they not invited? Did they not participate? They have more effect on carbon in Sacramento County than any other agency. Um, the discussion today and, and the resolution is mostly about money, money, money. But when these four agencies come together, the discussion should really be about policy, policy, policy. What are the policies that you can all agree on? Um, there's a focus today and everywhere and always on motor vehicle electrification. Techno glitter, as I call it. We have this wonderful solution that's gonna solve everything and everybody can keep on driving. What that does is it de-emphasizes a bunch of other things. Safe walking, bike share, reducing vehicle miles traveled, land use issues, and most importantly, electric bikes, which are the solution that everybody should be talking about. Not for every area, not for every person, but across society, they are the solution. I don't own an electric bike. I don't sell them. I know from my transportation experience that they are the best solution. When I rode up a hair on my bike today, I looked for a bike rack. No bike rack. I walked around the building. I noticed there's a bike rack on the other side that was not recommended 15 years ago by the National Bike Parking Guidelines. Um, acres of parking, acres of parking, parking garages scattered all over campus. I'm not picking on Sac State in particular. It's the kind of thing we see everywhere. People are focused on motor vehicles and they're focused on the big things and don't pay attention to the details. And that's what's wrong. Thank you. Speaker. Uh, we have Mackenzie Wiseman on behalf of Environmental Education Importance, followed by uh, Susan Kerr of Ocean Coast. Robert, if you could speak up a bit. Oh, my apologies. Thank you. All good. Hello, my name is Mackenzie Weezer. I'm the CEO of Sacramento Splash. We are an environmental education nonprofit. And I have the pleasure of knowing many of you here in this room. I've been doing great work around climate change for about the last decade. I'm very proud and impressed to see you all here today talking regionally because we can't do anything unless we're all working together. But why I'm here today is that next generation that you are so working hard to secure a wonderful world for is stuck in their classroom every single day. In fact, most kids only get outside about one hour a day. Scary. Uh, we at Sacramento Splash are bringing kids outside. All of the things that you guys care about, they don't know why they should care. So we need to connect more kids to the outdoors all day, every day. We can't do that without your funding and your support. So thank you for continuing to send us money. Have a great day. Thank you, Mackenzie. Next speaker. Uh, next speaker, we have Susan Kerr at Ecos on behalf of Environmental Council of Sacramento. Welcome. Hi, honorable board members. I'm Susan Harry. I'm the president of the Environmental Council of Sacramento. Um, today, you've talked about greenhouse gas has no borders and the need for regional coordination and the billions of dollars that are at stake. ECOS agrees with that entirely, but we'd also like to make the point that through the actions of this, these boards, and especially things like Green Means Go, we can have better communities. We can retrofit aging corridors. We can have housing near transit. We can have improved community spaces. And we can have residents that enjoy the lower combined cost of housing and transportation. So we really applaud 
the collaborative work here among the four agencies. Um, and just a plug, on December 1st, we're having a regional event. It's our annual environmental awards event. And we are honoring SACOG for its decades of work of regional significance. And I'd like to personally invite all of you, and if you haven't received an invitation from me by now, I'll, it's, it's in the mail, so to speak. But thank you very much. Those are all the speaker cards I currently have. Okay, and no other speakers? All right then. Now I will call the question. It's kind of anticlimactic at this point. All those in favor of the resolution? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion passes. Thank you very much. With that, is there any member of the public that would like to address the board that's not on the agenda, an item not on the agenda? Seeing and hearing none, uh, I want to thank everybody for being here, as was said earlier, getting these scheduled together. I don't know how it was done, but I do know it was done by four fantastic staffs. And this, you know, could not have been put together without the just phenomenal leadership and the staffs that we that we work with on a daily basis. So thank you. It's been great working with all of my colleagues. I look around the table, I see colleagues, I see peers, and mostly I see friends. So uh, with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.